Good. Misha. Hello, Jasha. Nice to meet you. Yes, and nice to see you again after so many years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Last time we met at the deep dive for yes. the Peer to Peer Foundation. Or With the Common Strategies Group. Common Strategy. Group. Yes, that's yes. right. We, we yeah. work together. Yeah. yeah, okay. So we're here in Graz at the Elevate Festival. We've both been speakers. I think the whole subject here is the great transformation uh, the future of human being on this planet yes. and and uh, eco psychology and and of course a lot of music as well yeah in the background this the forum of this Stadtpark here in Graz where most of the uh, panels and talks are held and I think your session is at five today at five so today do three hours okay good so I'm really pleased to meet you here and um, Michel Bowens, who uh, doesn't know you uh, from the people who watch this, you founded the Peer to Peer Foundation. Yes, it's an observatory of, mm -hmm. um, to say it easy, uh, of open collaborative systems. So we know the fact that people today can very easily through technology connect peer to peer. Yeah. In voluntary uh, projects. Yeah. Uh, they coalesce around a common goal. Mm -hmm. And so we call that peer production, and this is kind of uh, showing itself in the whole of society, in spirituality, in business, in politics. Yeah. So the structures uh, of human society are changing because this is added to the mix, and is you know so all the all institutions, state, market, commons, mm -hmm. are repositioning themselves around this possibility. Yeah, and you've done that for many for many years. Ten years, about ten yeah. years now. So but still, we, before you have been an intellectual and writer and, and yes, but, scientist uh, around these subjects. I was in business, so my time was very limited. So in 2003, okay. I, I uh, took leave, I took a two-year sabbatical to study phase transitions, so historical change. Right. And I came out with a theory of seed forms, so that when a, a system is in crisis, yeah. the solutions are not the same logic yeah. as the system that created the crisis. Okay. And so these seed forms will be all kinds of people trying to solve those issues in a different way. And so what you see is patterns emerging, mm -hmm. right? Patterns that prefigure in some way a new kind of coalescence. Oh. Um, and so to be short, my theory is that we are now market centric mm -hmm. and that we're moving to a common centric civilization. Okay. That doesn't mean the, the market and the state no longer exist. It means they they change because the priority will will be you know maintaining the resource base uh, for humanity to survive to have new relationships with nature and the environment mm -hmm. recognize interdependency all things that we're not doing right now yeah right that's really interesting and you already sort of touched upon all the questions i want to ask yeah. you today <laughs> in the short conversation and and the first one is really sort of uh, maybe an analysis if we're, if we're talking about processes and the process of which is also part of this festival here sort of the process of human civilization over the last I would say 150 years maybe when when industrialization yes. started what would you say from this fr from this process oriented view where are we standing right now okay so I would start maybe 5,000 years ago to explain okay. it. So <laughs> I, I think there right. is a underlying pulsation in human history mm -hmm. between extractive moments and regenerative moments. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have a class society, which more or less started 5,000 years ago, the the what, peer polities, as they called, so the the kingdoms, the you know the the chiefs, they're always in competition with their peers, and yeah. so they will tend to overuse. Uh, their own resources in order to win that competition. Mm -hmm. So we'll have population growth and let's say luxury uh, consumption mm -hmm. from the ruling class that will actually uh, overuse the local. And we can see this in agrarian civilizations until 
mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know, the advent of capitalism. And what would happen is they would, so the civilization would either collapse or they would move capitals like in China or in the Maya civilization. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, once you're exhausted, they, they, they move to another place and they start it over. Or barbarians will come in and, and restart the process. And capitalism basically thought it was liberated from that, right? So it, th it thought that through technology and productivity, uh, it could escape and it, it didn't. Uh, the result is now that we are at the global level. We have overreached at the global level. So that means there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it also means that we have to overcome the pulsation, actually. Yeah. So we really have to move towards a kind of steady state civilization mm -hmm. uh, that instead of just has a social contract as we have now, right, between capital and labor, mm -hmm. we actually need a compact between humanity and nature. Yeah. Uh, and we need to realize that the bees and, and the worms and, you know, every, that we're codependent on, on mm -hmm. all other life. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we've never done at scale. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, I think we've never really done it because, you know, even indigenous people wiped out millions in North America yeah. and, in, and yeah. in Australia. And they have never been uh, in this situation before. No, no, and they could move. So, yeah, the thing exactly. is that they could move yeah. and uh, we, there's nowhere to go. Yeah. So this is a really unprecedented crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, this is also yeah. what I'm working about. And so my solution that I'm proposing is that through mutualization, we can drastically lower the human footprint. Okay. while maintaining complex societies because the issue is today we have nuclear facilities that you know need 100,000 years of care yeah yeah so it's not just about going back no, to to the forest because mm -hmm. you you'll be irradiated anyway yeah <laughs> that's wonderful yeah. because that's basically what we're trying to do with the co-creation foundation yes. is trying to bring thinkers activists politicians etc together yes who who are starting or have already done research on yes. how this global governance could look like because I think we, I, I suggest, I, I would yeah. say we would agree that sort of the institutions like the UN or the World uh, yeah. uh, um, Bank um, are not really capable of no. doing this kind no. of governance anymore. So I, I just read an, an author that I really recommend is an Hungarian American called Peter Bogani. Uh -huh. And he, he thinks in terms of global systems that succeed each other. Yeah. And so what he calls global system one was the you know, Smithian, mm -hmm, Adam Smith mm -hmm. uh, type of capitalism, which was a total domination of capital over labor. Yeah. I was just reading in Lille in the north of France in 1830, okay. where 20,000 workers in the mines, they didn't have homes, they, were, they lived in the caves. They had 10,000 kids in 1830. Ten yeah. years later, only 600 were alive. Oh my uh, yeah. So this this is one yeah. system, and it ended with 1914, 1918, and 45, mm -hmm. 4045, a chaotic transition which established a social compact, right? Yeah. But it was done. So everything we see around us, our, our comfort, is done because we hyper exploited nature, and exported some problems to the global south. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a system of weak multilateralism. So in order to you know, in the Smithian era, we didn't have multilateral institutions. It was coalitions of countries. That's why we had world wars. Yeah, yeah. So then we have the IMF and the World Bank, and, and we shouldn't ignore their benefits for a while because they actually kept peace. Oh, yeah. To a certain degree. Well, that was what yeah. they were designed yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. As well. They're mediating institutions, yeah. right? After the Second but World War, they designed sort the, of this. The difference now is in an era of you know, ever more scarce resources, that we either fight for dominance. And I think that will be totally destructive, like the world wars, even worse yeah. today. Or we uh, we kind of uh, accept that nature has to be represented in human affairs. Yeah. And so one of the uh, proposals, this is uh, from another group called Reporting 3.0, is a Global Thresholds and Allocations Council. Mm -hmm. So imagine you'd have a group of scientists Mm -hmm. that would keep track of all the resources. Mm -hmm. And actually the American Chemical Society has a beautiful table of Mendeleev and if you click on the elements you can see how much is left of a resource. Oh, really? It's very really interesting. Okay. And basically this century, you know, whether it's in 10, 30 or 50 years, what we call peak resource moments will all succeed each other. Yeah. Right? So this is the century 
uh, we have to do this actually even before because of climate change. And so the question is, so how can we impose these limits without going into a fully authoritarian mode? Because that's yeah. what's happened when there's a war. Yeah. We have rationing. We, you know, look at how China responds to the coronavirus. Yeah. And so this is where your work comes in, actually, you know, mm -hmm. with co-creation and participation is how can we find a kind of marriage, a synthesis between coercive limits? Because we're yeah. not allowed to destroy the planet. Yeah. That's not a freedom we have. No. Because we kill everybody. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I think about the fires in Australia. It killed one billion animals. Yeah. Right? This is not, and this is not freedom for me. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. uh, so at the same time, these limits have to be coercive. At the same time, we want to keep our human freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So can I give you an example of how this could work? Yes, yes, please. Okay. So I get this from a, a blockchain project, and I mm -hmm. have my critiques on blockchain. Mm -hmm. But in this case, what's, what's interesting is the capacity to create global public ledgers, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. shared accounting system where everybody can participate. Yeah. So let's say we want to decarbonize, right? So instead of imposing it, or purely through taxation, or we can say, we will reward everybody mm -hmm. that can prove they do decarbonization. Yeah. So you go to the ledger, mm -hmm. you verify your activity. Yeah. Uh, you get recognized. You get you get tokens. Yeah. And then the big question is how do we fund these tokens? That can be done through taxation. It's a mm -hmm. public policy priority. It can also be done by recognizing externalities. Mm -hmm. So if you're a farmer and you improve your soil every year, today there is no mechanism to reward you. Yeah. The mechanism is if you destroy your soil, yeah. that's when you get rich, yeah. right? But now but you would... Exactly, so you would say, okay, I'm actually, doing biochar, yeah. I, I, uh, I show my biochar, soil. I get recognized, mm -hmm. and so I have contributed to bringing carbon down, and, it, and so I get, we get what I call circular finance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why is this interesting? Because it, 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 it mobilizes the whole, the whole population. You mm -hmm. can have this kind of Darwinian yeah. But in a positive sense, yeah. right? Yeah. A generative Darwinian competition yeah. to see what works. Yeah. And everybody can be creative. Yeah. You don't yeah. have to follow. Uh, and so your top success down. is actually tied to, to the success of the Earth ecosystem, basically. Exactly, exactly. So, so yeah. finding, uh, because this is the, the, the issue today, right? So all the people who today are doing regenerative work yeah. are marginalized. Yeah. Yeah, they're precarious, they they're poor. It doesn't show up in their uh, budget. Because the money the comes account. from the extractive activity. Yeah. And then we tax or do philanthropy to rebalance afterwards. Yeah. So what we should actually have is the idea of warm and cold currencies, yin and yang, mm -hmm. male, female, mm -hmm. in a way, where, of course, we need to extract. I mean, mm -hmm. if, in order to eat, uh, unfortunately, even if we're vegetarian, we are... Yeah you know, taking something from nature and transforming it. Uh, but at the same time, we need warm currencies that actually directly, um, sh you know, uh, benefit us mm -hmm. when we do something good for the planet and yeah. for other living beings. Now, this, this uh, is a really interesting solution. It makes a lot of sense immediately yes. to me. The question for me is like with any other solutions, which are uh, very, um, rational and, and make sense, how can we implement it or what would this system need on a sort of governance basis right. so that it can be implemented? Who would have the power and the interest to actually implement a system like yes. this? So legally speaking, we don't have all the tools that we need because we, we come from a world which only recognizes public and private. Yeah. And the commons has disappeared from mm -hmm. our legal system. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to restore this. And, and, but there's a good science, like in Italy, mm -hmm. we have a public commons protocol for cooperation okay. that started in Bologna, that now has 250 cities doing the same. And it has mobilized one million Italian people in doing regenerative work in their urban commons. Yeah. Right? So, so instead of having just state and market, which is what we have now, we have to have state, commons and market. And okay. commons is both people and nature. Mm -hmm. So through the commons, through, for example, trusts, mm -hmm. the idea that we have to keep the capital, also the natural capital. Yeah. Right. And here I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. I don't say marketization of nature. I just say 
Yeah, it's a third category. It's it's a recompense for your work. Yeah. yeah. You're you're not commodifying nature. You're just saying people who do good should be able to mm -hmm. live and have livelihoods just as people who extract. That would also give in a way nature a voice in in, in politics and governance, wouldn't yes. it? Because yes. it some somehow becomes a relevant force we have to reckon with and we have to on on eye level have to find ways yes. of, of cooperation. This is what we're trying to do by giving legal personhood, you know, yeah. in New Zealand, yeah. in Bolivia, yeah. in Ecuador. Yeah. Uh, there's an interesting technological project which I think some people might not like, but I think it's an interesting way of thinking. Uh, so we have the blockchain, which is like a common accounting system. Mm -hmm. And there's a notion that comes out of that, which is called a DAO, Distributed Autonomous Organization. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically kind of automatization of common exchanges that we have in mm -hmm. life so that things become easy. And so here's the idea. It's called a sovereign nature movement. A sovereign? Nature movement. Nature so movement. you okay. consider the forest or the river as basin sovereign. as a sovereign entity. Mm -hmm. You help it do this by you know, placing sensors and, and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So for example, you have a forest and some people are over cutting trees. Yeah. It knows. Yeah. It can send uh, a message to the lawyers who mm -hmm. can then on behalf of the forest mm -hmm. intervene and protect the forest. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing is the forest is a trust, mm -hmm. right? So in complicated words, non-dominium, it belongs to no one. Yeah. It belongs to itself. Yeah. Right? And so all the people who then contribute to the forest get a livelihood for their contributions because the, por the forest gets income and can also pay out. Mm -hmm. And so imagine you have two forms of income, one which is your salary, which is you know, your, the human society, the human civilization, and then by building all these commons we slowly build a second form of income, which is a generative income mm -hmm. from all the contributions you've made to the well-being of the planet and your fellow human beings. So that's, this is called binary economics. That's wonderful. Um, it, it, but it probably needs also a lot of technology and big data. Uh, or yes. are there also sort of maybe spiritual means of uh, yes. so, sort so of the, communicating? The own, well, I, I know this is actually about psychedelics here, but I, I turn it around. I don't think that animistic and shamanistic people loved nature because they took ayahuasca. I think they took ayahuasca because they were already connected with nature mm -hmm. and they wanted mm -hmm. more connection. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm... I think in terms of modes of exchange and so how we relate to people and nature, mm -hmm. which is often the same. Yeah. So if we exploit humans, we exploit nature. Yeah, sure. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's a, it, there's a logic to this kind of, uh, there's a convergence and it's basically treating others as a resource for us rather than treating them as, mm -hmm. you know, independent mm -hmm. beings, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we don't recognize their livingness or their humanness. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so if you do commoning, um, and I live in Thailand, so my, my family is a commons, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. So commons is something you work together on. So in the, so the extended family, it means I go, I go there, they think I'm a rich Westerner, I wasn't. Uh, okay. I had some financial issues. So for two years I lived there, didn't pay rent, got my food, got everything. Then, okay, things get better, I build a house, okay, I get 10 people coming to me. Yeah. 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 But it's not the same people. It's because it's so it's not because I give you something that you give me something back. Because I give something to the family that the family mm -hmm. will give me something mm -hmm. back, right? And it's not yeah. individual yeah. to individual. So what I'm trying to explain is if you live in a commons, let's say you have orange trees here, yeah? Mm -hmm. If my tree is dead, I can go to another tree. I don't have to be afraid. So it changes my psychology already, it does. right? It's not magic. It's, yeah, yeah. There's a logic to how we behave with each other. And that's why, for example, you can be a mafia guy, but you can be a very good father. Yeah. Because... It often goes hand in hand. <laughs> well, it's because you, the context is different. Yeah. You think, yeah. okay, here is war. I act as a warrior. I have to win. Here it's love. It's also and about boundaries. This is part yeah, of my yeah. comments, my children, and my the, family. And the problem is that we have these competing logics and we, we decided as humanity, 
some people decided for us more, more realistically that yeah. the competing logic would be the logic of competition for scarcity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're all behaving more and more everywhere as if everything was scarce. Michel, I have two yeah. more questions. So yeah, yeah. I and, uh, no, I it's, on. it's wonderful. <laughs> and actually, uh, you al already answered all the questions okay. <laughs> I would have asked you. And it's wonderful. It's, it's a very precise and condensed um, um, picture I'm getting from, from yeah. what you're saying. And it resonates a lot to, to what we're trying to do and, and where we are going. There's one question I often get asked yeah. and I have no answer to it. That is, if we're going to install sort of a governance system, global governance system along these ideas, yes. there will be those with power who will oppose it. Yes. What are we going to do with that? Okay. So there's two things. Yeah. yeah. So human systems are not rational. Uh, they have axioms they all believe in and that they frame reality. And so what you see is that human systems behave like complex adaptive systems, which means they, they change through chaotic transitions. They don't change through nicely discussion, you know, what would be the best solution. No, because yeah. we have interests that yeah. cut through these yeah. rational ag agreements. So unfortunately what that means is that when a system stops working as it does now, it means all the binding elements dissolve first, right? And then what usually happens is you have an exodus of people for whom the system no longer works. Mm -hmm. And think about the, the hermits leaving the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. which eventually become the monasteries of the, you know, the Christians. Mm -hmm. So these are people leaving the system. So what do you say? It's an inevitability that systems like, like Putin or Erdogan or it's autocratic a, states will dissolve and because okay, people I think will first not we will have conflict. Anymore? First, we will have yeah, conflicts, yeah. for example, between the U.S. and China. Yeah. Um, and while this is going on on one level, you have people looking for solutions at, in seed form level, yeah. right? Sure. And then at some point, there is a, a collective awareness that changes mm. that says this is where we have to go. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, it's usually not the same people, right? Think yeah. about yeah. the Romans who thought uh, labor was for slaves and bad. And then suddenly you have the Christians saying, no, work is good. Yeah. You know, uh, we are creating, helping the divine order on earth yeah. through work. Yeah. It's a completely different um, mentality. And that's, that's why maybe even people like me, at the most, we are bridging, you know, mm -hmm. but it's the new type of young people mm -hmm. that will have no emotional connection to how it works today because it's not working for them and they will be motivated to seek more radical change and it will be first at the margins uh, and then the question is how do we make it the norm? Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean we have to wait for the worst to happen? No. Let's make it as smooth as we can. Yeah. So the more we have commons, the more we have public commons protocols, the more we have open collaborative systems, the more we have co-creation participation, the more, you know, the, the lower the price yeah, that we will pay, okay. right? But I don't uh, want to kind of, I don't want nice to have an utopian view. vision that. Yeah, uh, no, but it does make sense. In, yeah. a, in a way, I believe the same. But there's this, there's always this fear, like we're building these things, and then the powerful people come and just destroy it. And and some people are, I feel, um, they're afraid of starting something beautiful. Mm. Um, yeah, because they are afraid that's that really some will, will destroy yeah. it. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's self-defeating. It, it is in a way, yeah. it is in a way. One, la one yeah. last question, Michel. Um, I'm always interested, what, what connects you on a personal level of your personal process to the work you're doing and the theories you're, you're, you're yeah, well, thinking about? Um, it's weird to say. I, I like to use William James, um, who wrote a fantastic book called Varieties of Religious Experience, mm -hmm. which is uh, all the biographies of the founders of new religions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said there's something very typical ab about them that's really like the shamans, mm -hmm. right? So it means first you have to have a crisis and then you change. Yeah. And he calls it the difference between the once born and the twice born. Once born people are lucky. Mm -hmm. They have nice parents, nice village. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the kind of the, the way forward seems clear yeah. and seems more like an emulation. Yeah. You know, just following the path. Yeah. And then there are people like me and, you know, I don't wish it on anybody who kind of get born and say, what, what is this? Like something is wrong with the operating system. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the gnostic condition. It's like I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. And so these people usually need to go through some crisis. And that's what I had in my 40s. I mm -hmm. said, OK, I'm not doing well. This is my midlife. If I don't do it now, you know, then my life is not a success. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, one of the main things that I felt I had to do was to change the world. I know it really sounds like, no, you it's know, wonderful. I can relate uh, to that. <laughs> you know, who do you think you are? Yeah, kind of yeah. a reaction. But you know, that's what I felt. And as soon as I, I accepted this, it's like a nuclear bomb. You know, it's like you have all this energy. Yeah. Because the reason you are not happy is actually because you don't do it. Yeah. You know, you have some profound desire in yourself, in your, that you're not uh, expressing and precisely because the reason you said is oh you know the world is is not like that will never work and the re so what I want to tell to those people is you're actually doing the job of those you're afraid of you're already mm -hmm. defeating yourself mm -hmm. yeah right you're already you're right incorporating yeah the you're, reaction you're, of the you're, powerful you're blocking all the energy yeah. you could actually yeah make life yeah. worthwhile yeah yeah, and that's why you need a, 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 a few crazy people. <laughs> wow. That, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really happy that we did this. <laughs> <laughs> it was short, compact. Um, yeah. I got all my questions answered and, and it was very personal Thank as you. well yeah, yeah. in the end. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Yeah. Thank you.